Hello my fellow hammerheads and welcome to the first lore part for the Daughters of Cain. In this video we will cover the events which led to the creation of the Daughters of Cain. But before we begin I recommend that you buy and read the battle tome and the stories for yourself, because only this way we can support Games Workshop, the Black Library, their authors and you can enjoy the unabridged stories for yourself. As always, I will provide the faction-specific terminology in the description box down below. As for every new wonderful being watching this, as every video could be someone's first, these law videos are meant to be role-played. I don the mantle of a traveler who gathers information about the law and welcomes you in my newly set up Hammerhead Inn, which is located somewhere in the mortal realms. Now I won't waste any more of your time. Let's begin. Ah, hello my friend. Welcome back to the Hammerhead Inn. I see the events which are set to motion have piqued your interest. The realms are shaking and are near to the point of breaking. But to understand what is happening, I have to tell you about the Daughters of Cain and their leader, the Shadow Queen Morathi. The Daughters of Cain seek power through bloodshed, honoring Cain with every kill. Everyone who witnesses their gory rituals shudders while well, these graceful murderers sacrifice the hearts of their victims to their deity. If you cross them, you will invite certain death. Fighting is their religion. To spill the blood of their enemy is their prayer. The she-elves may look beautiful in the distance, but up close you can see the hatred in their eyes with every fresh kill. The longer the battle takes, the more ferocious they get, the stronger their fury is fueled, the closer they get to their deity. No one survives the slaughter. To understand them, you must understand that Cain is an ancient god from the world that was. He was often mistaken by the common folk as an avatar of the Chaos God Khorne, who has tricked the elves of old to fight for his side. But Cain was powerful, and he is the god of murder. Some say that he has been killed or destroyed, a claim which you should not utter in hearing distance to the matriarchal elf cult, and believe me, they have very good ears. If they hear these claims, they will kill that person and sacrifice their hearts to Cain. For a very long time, elves were very rare in the mortal realms, except in the realm of shadows, Ulgu. Only with Sigmar's opening of the realm gate to Azir, they spread like wildfire, building shrines to Cain everywhere. But Cain is not the only one who predates the birth of the mortal realms in this cult. There is their leader, Morathi. A sorceress without equal, a mere mortal elf with the power to rival the gods and the mother of Malarion. Even now, every faction of order fears the daughters of Cain, but everyone knows that their hatred of chaos is rooted deep within the every fiber of their beings. Aiding the Queen of the Sylvaneth, Alariel, to destroy the plague of Nurgle from her realm, Gairan, the Daughters of Cain fought with more zeal than everyone else. But claims of savagery and the gruesome rituals give pause to even the most ardent supporters. Now that you know about whom we're talking, let me tell you about their origins in the infamous Age of Myth. Allies and foes alike seek to learn more about the She-Elves, but as their origin lies in Urgu, the realm of shadows, it is nigh impossible to find anything useful. 
as it is in the realm of darkness, misdirection, half-truths and half-lies. Well, at least, if you don't know how to navigate the realm. <laughs> Marathi was the first to regain consciousness. She fell from unknown heights and impacted in the umbrellic sea with only her mastery of magic to thank for her survival. For what seemed like an eternity, she wandered around in torment before her mind became her own again. Like Teclis and Tyrion in Hayish, it seems like she had to wander around in Urgu. Morathi has a natural adaptation to shadow magic as she has wielded it long before in the world that was so it was second nature to her to permeate the realm of shadow. Back then, she used blood sacrifices to Cain to maintain her youthful vigor and appearance, but in the mortal realms, these offerings were useless. Her body was old and broken, more akin to the serpentine monster she was compared to back in the old days with her split tongue and writhing appearance a reminder of chaos and her tormentor. Alone, she summoned herself spirits from the hidden places, mist elementals and shadow demons. With these entities, she explored the vast landscapes of Urgu. Every single one of the 13 regions of Urgu she visited gave away their secrets to her, but never another of her kin. Everywhere she went, the creatures reacted repulsively. A constant reminder of her appearance, she shed bitter tears, for vanity had been her greatest failing. With magic and illusions, she attempted to regain her old form. She swallowed coils of penumbral magic and transformed to a semblance of her beautiful self before the shattering of the world that was. But she could only stay in this form while concentrating on it. If rage or passion overcomes her, the serpentine being she truly is will come forward. In her elven form, she crossed the path of her son, Malarian. The reunion was cold and distant. There was too much bad blood between them to ever forgive the other. Malarian had something Marathi was very jealous about. He had achieved godhood. Immortal and even imbued with greater affinity in shadow magic. Only their common goal in finding more of their elven kin led them to join forces. And as Sigmar's journey reached Ulgu, he found both of them working together. As both of them used shadow magics, they raised up a great citadel called Druhiroth, as a seat of the largest of the thirteen kingdoms of Ulgu. As Sigma was a great help to them, they joined in his growing alliance of order against chaos. Morathi and Malarion were an immense help in bringing civilization to the mortal realms, and even a few of the elven kin were found. But they decided to stay in Azerheim. No one really trusted the two shadowy magic wielders, but where Malarion was praised, Morathi was shunned. Even the gods of light, Tyrion and Teclis, sided with Malarion and avoided Morathi, as rumors circled throughout that she had freely given herself to Slanesh. She became even more suspicious as she avoided to answer questions from her past, even those how she had managed to escape from the Dark Prince. Back in the world that was, she manipulated everyone with her charm and her beauty. In the Age of Myth, nothing seemed to work as every one of the deities ignored her advances until Nagash sensed spells of seduction emitting from Morathi and he struck her down. In her rage, she lost control over her form and transformed back to, into the winged serpentine monstrosity she really is. She left the alliance and built her own dwelling in Ulgu, but Malarian rejected her suggestion to split the rule of Ulgu. He is the god of shadow, and she 
was a mere mortal. But to get rid of her, he gave her a small plot of land in the Umbral Vale, the darkest region of Ulgu. The one no one ever came back from with their sanity intact, except Malarian himself. Morathi's only followers were the elves who still worshipped Cain, and so the city of Hagnar came to be. Her followers believed to a dead faith. There was almost no power to gain in this pitiful queendom. Changing her ways, she would not manipulate from behind a throne, like in the world that was, and the best opportunity came to be as Malarian came with great news. The elves of old were found, and the elven pantheon needed her help to save them. As Taglis found the elf souls, he sought out Tyrion and Malarian and devised a plan to free them from the belly of the beast known as the Dark Prince Slanesh. There is a sub-realm between Ulgu and Hayish called Ulgish, in which they wanted to trap their nemesis. But they needed to balance out the magic of light with magic of shadow. So they asked Morathi for help, as she is a powerful magic wielder as well, and the three suspected that she might have hidden knowledge about the enemy. As Taklis surmised, Morathi was once trapped herself, and she had to share the information on how she escaped, because the goal was not only to punish Slanesh, but to free the elf souls from captivity. Only then, she shared her memories with the gods. Suffering was her constant companion, and she caused the Dark Prince to vomit her back into reality. Using the information and the energies of both Ulgu and Hayish, they succeeded in capturing Slanesh and immediately started to extract the souls from him. Without Morathi, this would not be possible. Every participant has received a portion of the Elf Souls, and while the Gods of Light created the Ideneth and the Lumineth, two very different races on which I can share much information with you, the God of Shadows created the Umbraneth. We will talk another time about them. Morathi promised to remold the souls into new warriors of Cain, and so the Math Core was created. With sacrifices, shadow magic and her own blood, the first Meluzai and Kinnerai were born, her most loyal handmaidens. As blood rituals fueled the temple's expansion, Marathi claimed that Cain himself spoke to her and named herself High Oracle. As she told the newly born elves on how Cain has fought the Chaos Gods and was destroyed, she also told them that he was regaining power thanks to the worship of his followers. So she sent out witch elves to reclaim Cain's broken shards. As the other gods struggled with their first batch of souls, Marathi used the weak and damaged souls to create a male working class that serves the she-elves. Those are known as the Leothanam, yet another elven word for half-soul. The daughters of Cain were a fast-growing faction. Just within generations, they flourished from a small cult to a city-state. But soon, Hagnar overcrowded and the occupants started to tear each other apart in their fights for supremacy in the hierarchy. So Morathi declared to establish new temple colonies. Each Hag Queen and her followers fixated upon one aspect of Cain, be it assassination, single combat and so on. But still, they bowed to Marathi as she is the High Oracle of Cain. Those who didn't listen, like the Gritwa and the Red Blades, were destroyed in the blood strives. The daughters of Cain slaughter everything in their way in search of new lands. Monsters, Aurochs and even Sigmar's followers. One day, Sigmar asked them what had happened. As usual, Marathi lied and told him that the free people were tainted by chaos and that she had to put them down. 
With the expansion of the Daughters of Cain, Morathi founded the sect of Kaldna and built the temple upon a powerful spiral of shadow magic. A good place to defend, but the Daughters had to kill everything in their surrounding from the most monstrous beasts to the savage bone splitters. As the elven gods were preoccupied with Slanish and the forming of new elves, the gods of chaos invaded the mortal realms. And thus began the Age of Chaos. As the forces of chaos invaded the mortal realms, the daughters of Cain relished the thought of sacrificing more and more to the bloody handed god. So they aided the forces of order across the realms. But still, everyone had their suspicions about Marathi and the She-Elves. Even with the forces of the Cainites, the forces of order had to withdraw, because the pact between Nagash and Zygma was broken, and they lost a huge amount of allies to fight the tide of corrupted monsters and chaos followers. At first, the Shadowlands of Ulgu were left to their own, as the remaining Chaos Gods devoted their forces into other realms and only small forces were sent there. But in later stages of the Age of Chaos, the armies invading the realm grew larger and larger, invading Ulgu ever deeper. But only the followers of the Dark Prince ventured far into the realm as they followed the scent only they could sense. But the magic used by the elven pantheon was so strong and Slanish remained undetected. But there is a small force led by a mortal Lord of Pain who is still seeking a way to their deity. The magic used by the gods was slightly changed by Morathi that she would receive a small portion more of the siphon souls. Slowly, this alteration helped the Dark Prince to gather energy in a very slow manner, and as he was suspended perfectly between Ulgu and Haish, Slanish incrementally tilted more to Ulgu. This was enough for the Slanishi forces to invade the realms of shadows. This was the start of the Kathra duel the War of Shadows. Morathi led from the front and destroyed the Keeper of Secrets, Glitters, and his legion of access, Krulu Shavr, and her Flayer host. Not only did she fight hand to hand, but with the help of a Medusae coven, she trapped the six unbeatable warhosts of Bovax the Despoiler in a shadow labyrinth in which they still wander up to this day. However, as more powerful and larger armies invaded Ulgu, she had to call the first Kailish Coven, a gathering of all the sects. The Slaneshi armies, under the command of Luxius the Keeper, succeeded in the destruction of the Temple of Grogska, and would have fought more if not Sigma had begun his war to reclaim the mortal realms. The Slanaishis had to retreat and fight a greater foe. Still, the Daughters of Cain were too slow in fighting back, as the temple of Nephtal was corrupted and had to be destroyed by their own hands. During the Kathra duel, a war between the Daughters of Cain and the Idoneth erupts, as the Domhain and Fuyathan enclaves prefer elven souls and navigate throughout Ulgu to ambush several covens. Meanwhile, Skaven assassins are discovered and a series of retaliatory strikes ensues and escalate quickly into the Skaven War, in which many covens are being raided by the Redkin. At last, the Age of Sigma begins. During the Realmgate Wars, the Daughters of Cain had to hide many of their bloody rites, but they used Sigmar's momentum to expand their empire. However, at first, Morathi hid in the shadows of Ulgu and only after a while, when she saw an opportunity to gain some power, 
she came forth and helped the god king in his war. The Idunath were no real strangers to the daughters, as they have fought against each other in the past age. In Gairan, the Cainites were again ambushed by their underwater kin, as the Temple of Kraith were aiding the Everqueen Alariel in the War of Life. During the Realmgate Wars, the Daughters of Cain fought in hundreds of battles, and while the hallowed knight Stormhost never trusted them, the Knights Excelsior commended them for their zeal in battle. The Sylvaneth fought willingly beside them, but no one found more common ground with their Cainite worshipping kin than the Scourge privateers. After Sigmar's war, the Temple of Dreishiganet were the first to build shrines to Cain in the cities of Sigmar, entertaining the common folk with gladiatorial battles alongside Sigmar's armies. Sadly, with the end of the Realmgate Wars, the mortal and immortal forces of Slanish again besieged Ulgu in their search of their dark patron, covering much ground and fighting over the Shadow Path network, occupying Marathi's attention. In the end, before the events of the Necroquake, Nagash claims that many elven souls belong to him, because in his words, they escaped death. Morathi is called to help defend the cities of Sigma, but she only orders her forces to fight when there were monetary or political reasons, if the enemy was not undead or a cult of Slanesh. I hope the information I gave you will burn away the shadows of deception. The mortal realms have to know more about the daughters of Cain. But what do you think about them? I'm keen to know what you think about them. Just leave me a note under my table. Next time I will tell you more about their society. But for now I have to rest. I hope you will lend your ear to my stories again. I have many more for you to quench your thirst for knowledge. You just have to listen for the bell and you will know that I'm here again, waiting for you. Have a good night, friend, and please, stay fantastic. Bye.